Yes. Right. Welcome. Um, Brian, do you want to start out or do you want me to just dive right into the slide deck? Um, yeah, I'll just welcome everybody to the, the uh, curriculum committee. So we have Wednesday, February 8th, just to document that since this will go up on the website. Um, and our committee, since it's kind of just reforming, um, we have Jenna and Carolyn and Yulia, um, all from the school board, just so everybody knows who's here. And then I see that Sue is joining us as well. So yeah, so we have uh, Monique set up the uh, agenda for tonight, just uh, kind of to get us all acquainted with how this will go um, on this particular committee, but I'll let her kind of run with that and explain that. And then I did leave a, a section at the end of our agenda for any discussion or questions that people might have. I know Jenna texted me before that she might have something. Um, so great. Yeah, we can jump right into it. Super. And for this committee, it can go in um, any direction. It's up to the committee members. There are some things that are some to do's. <clears throat> so we need to make time for those. And one of those is the program of studies. So let me share my screen here. Oh, Monique, if you're taught, I think you muted yourself. Am I back now? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, let's see if I can do this. Try this. Can you hear me now? Yes. Yep. Yes. Okay. Terrific. <clears throat> so what we I do is I have an action plan that I operate off of, and I'll give you the bird's eye view of that action plan through these slides. But the entire action plan is linked right there. Um, and so very often, uh, as is in the past, um, Committee members will go through that and take a look and write down some questions and we have conversations at the next meeting. Um, our projects or the pro projects that I focus on are in line with our school improvement plan or our district improvement plan with the four goals. Our four improvement targets are embedded within policy. <clears throat> and so every year we have a focus around that. This year, our district wide goal is around SEL. So for today's meeting, for this committee, I'm going to do it in the area, the big, um, the big areas um, <clears throat> where the detail is there. It, there's a lot in the action plan and um, much might need to be translated. I'm happy to translate. We use lots of acronyms um, unintentionally. And then tonight we'll also do the program of studies and then wrap up around topics for this committee's consideration. So one of the big areas is the comprehensive education planning. We call that our school improvement efforts. Um, <clears throat> we use a process, a data analysis process called DataWise. The state uh, comprehensive needs assessment process ensures data-driven goals that we have. And so we do track our goals with data. For example, around the SEL goal that we have as a district goal, we're using the panorama survey data to track that progress. Now that also impacts our ESSA, Every Student Succeeds Act. That's the federal funding that we receive. Um, that means Title IA, Title IIA, and Title IV. Title IA is about $175,000. Title IIA runs about $80,000 to $85,000. And Title IV is about $12,000. And I'll talk a little bit more about what we do with each of those projects. Um, right now, our federal funding is aligned to our goals around literacy, math, and the social emotional learning. So managing that grant process, um, doing the grant, doing the report, gathering the data, engaging people in the conversations um, is all part of that planning process. 
quality instruction is another big area. I spend a lot of time supporting our instructional coaches. Their role is dual. Their role is the curriculum coordination. When I work with groups to coordinate a curriculum, they're the in the classroom, on the ground, helping teachers learn how to do that. They also help with um, developing professional development and they each have plans of action that they do and they work with the building principal to make sure that they're also working towards building goals as well. The other area around quality instruction is summer programming for both staff and students. That's really the time we have in order to provide you know, a full day of staff PD or multiple days of staff professional development and summer programming. We run programs for students in order to um, try to offset the summer slide that happens when students are not in school over the summer. And we usually target our struggling students around that um, to help provide continued support. And then there's the curriculum coordination. <clears throat> we had started a steering committee. Um, I think the pandemic and the energies around um, uh, just all that people were involved in, that has stalled a bit. Um, so we had insufficient membership. It was hard. We, we were gone are the days when we can release teachers and spend a full day focusing on those pieces. Um, so there's been just people trying to take care of themselves. Um, there's been a little bit of resistance to getting together for those. So what I've done is leverage the current structures we have in place in terms of our leadership councils and the building lead teachers. Uh, and I bring those efforts to those groups for moving forward. So this year, um, the curriculum coordination, one of the big pieces that we're spending a lot of time on, particularly K-4, is a foundational reading skills. We knew from the data that we had some issues with phonics. We went through a significant review process last year. Uh, and we identified an evidence-based program. It's called From Phonics to Reading. Um, and we're in the first year implementation of doing that phonics curriculum. Uh, the instructional coaches are in every classroom modeling lessons on a daily basis to help support teachers in learning how to do that and use those resources. K-12, we're in support of the SEL efforts. I'll talk a little bit more about that when we talk about our SEL specialists and our projects. Um, each building has projects and activities and an action plan going on. We have a K-12 steering committee for SEL and we have building-based steering committees. Um, just today, I spent three hours this morning with the K-2 group, a work group who is reviewing curriculum materials for direct instruction and in SEL. Uh, and they've gotten to a point where they're making a recommendation and developing an implementation plan. And you'll see, you'll hear more about that through the budget process because I keep funds aside for new implementation and that would be an implementation for next year. And then we're trying to get back to some pre-pandemic um, um, practices where um, we will bring representatives from a content area together K-12 for a day and really map out what's working well, how are kids doing, what's not working well, what professional development might be needed what um, coordination might be needed. K-12, we, uh, we, we've we got some tentative dates for performing arts. We wanna take a look at the standards, the state standards. We haven't had a chance to do that, but also look at our current programming in terms of performing arts, whether that be music, chorus, band, that whole area. We also have some coordinating to do with science K-12. Um, middle school has done some adjustments as a result of the pandemic. The high school has um, somewhat, and K-5, um, we did a little bit of work during the pandemic, but it's time to bring K-12 together to make sure that we're vertically articulated so that what we learn at one phase level, it builds off in the next phase level. And then certainly health and PE, they have new state standards, and we haven't been able to get together K-12 to do that work either yet. So we, we're trying to schedule some dates for representatives to come together. Um, another big area is um, assessment and reporting coordination. Um, I coordinate all of the local and state assessments. Many of those now are online. Uh, and I try to stay sane and help people stay sane with an assessment calendar, which outlines the assessments, the windows in which they take place, and buildings can sort of look at each other's work on, in that area. 
Um, that is always, that document is always a work in progress. Um, this year, this spring, the state is using a new assessment, new state assessment. So most of my March, I believe I have five meetings, different sorts of meetings with the DOE this in March to um, learn more about that and help get the district ready for that implementation this spring. Um, we spend time reflecting and assessing our own assessment system. One of our worries is, are we assessing too much? Um, I just met with K-5 um, literacy folks where we just put all the assessments down, we're targeting what it means when the data comes in to see if we can't be more efficient. We also use our data. Um, we have been working quite a bit with our data analytics solution, which is attached to our student information systems. I've been working with the instructional coaches on this. Some of the data we get back, it's in large files like state data or <clears throat> iReady data, and that gets automatically imported. It's the classroom-based core assessments that we needed to figure out a way to get into that system. And we worked on that in June, some in August, and we have a method for getting that data in there. So I've been working with coaches on that. And then it's reporting to parents in public. I usually do a rather um, large presentation in the spring, and it's really a report on our goals. The other piece, um, the fifth piece is instructional technology coordination. Uh, I should jump right to the last bullet. Just about every set of curriculum materials has an online component. Uh, what we need to do with that online component, first of all, review it to see if it indeed is um, helps our students learn more or better, or is it just a fancy graphic? Um, we also, in terms of rostering our students, providing our students access, we're very careful about the data um, and the terms of service. Um, we have recently um, connected with a service to help us do that, manage the student data privacy agreements with each of our vendors. Uh, but we also look at com compatibility. Is it going to mess something else up on our systems? So we have technology instructional coaches to support the teachers, and then we have field techs. And I work very closely with the IT department to make sure that the wires, plugs, devices are working well, and the software works well when teachers access the software for their students. So uh, what we're gonna do now is we're gonna shift into proposed changes to the program of studies. Um, but then we can talk about um, what more you might want to um, learn about um, and um, topics for the next meetings and our schedule and all of those sorts of things and um, engaging in that um, data review process for our school improvement efforts. Um, so with that, I'd like to introduce Sue Ketch, if that's okay, um, unless there are some burning questions or some pieces about that. You just got the nickel tour. I feel like I just poured a glass of water from a fire hose for you. Good evening. Monique, did the committee get Karen's recent um, packet of program of studies? That's not the, not the entire packet, but I can send that along to this group. Okay. So I'm going to kind of work my way through that if it's okay. Um, so a lot of our new proposals this year, I would say this is um, not a heavy year for changes. I think we're fairly light on changes, but I'd like to go over what is new. Um, and so um, one thing that I would say um, this year, a lot of our changes are kind of focused on meeting the needs of, of students um, in that the first thing that's listed is foundations of algebra. And that is, has come about this year. We have um, many more students that are refugees um, that have joined the high school this year than, than we have in the past. And so we're looking at a few things differently to make those accommodations. Um, and one thing we have found um, as we've been working on this is that we have some students that um, are really not ready for what we've been offering in general for high school math. So Scarborough High School um, for a number of years now, I would say more than five, um, we've started um, high school math at Algebra One 
And um, the sort of the, the lowest end of that is Algebra 1 um, spread out of over two years, Algebra A and Algebra B. And this year we've had students that are just not ready um, to leap into algebra. Um, one piece I would share is that our ELL teacher, Leah Zook, who is amazing and wonderful, but her strengths I think are mostly in English and social studies. And so we've been trying to figure out some ways to support her work and um, to specialize on that. And so we've created um, sort of an independent study this year for Foundations of Algebra, but we want to roll that into a course for students that may, may be entering Scarborough High School and need some readiness to get to that algebra level. The other math course that um, we're re-offering, we have certainly run this in the past, um, as we have Foundations of Algebra too, um, but um, is accounting, and we have a new business teacher, um, Jim Cronin moved up from the middle school to join the high school this year. He has an MBA and he's been talking to students and has had a lot of students interested in taking an accounting course as sort of an entry level into business programs, et cetera. And so we've um, brushed the accounting course off and are rolling it out again um, to see if there's student interest to run a section of that. In science and biology, I go back again to some of our ELL students um, that are having trouble keeping up with all the language associated in the science courses. And um, we are very fortunate at the high school. Um, one of our teachers, Toby Walsh, is certified in both environmental science and biology. And he is very interested in doing a looping course around um, the biology and environmental, where we would have a focus on the language component for those students as well. And what we're thinking is that we would run um, environmental science one year with him, and then the next year he would teach the bio. And so students, whenever they came in, if they needed that extra language support in science, they would start with him with whichever course he's teaching that year, take the other one with him the next year, and then they'd be ready. Um, we're hoping that the language piece will have um, been productive enough over those two years that then they could join chemistry or another science class um, on their own. So again, we're looking at covering that same material, but just doing it in a little bit different way and really trying to support some of those English language um, learners in those courses. Then um, beyond that, that's our big list. Beyond that, there are some updates um, in several of the departments, more um, small things. Um, I would say in um, fine arts, um, in the band classes, we have a new band teacher um, this year, um, Renee Richardson, who taught band for decades used a fundamental um, theory and playing book with all of her bands. Tim is not um, doing that. He would like to design the um, that work to more match the music they're playing and um, to be directly linked to their music. So we've taken um, the name of that book out of the band courses. In chorus, um, this coming year, we're changing the name of it. We're going to call course just Corral instead of two different courses. And we're gonna offer Corral over two different periods. And our hope would be that that would help with scheduling conflicts for our over 50 students that are in course these days. Um, we've got a few course name changes. Our video teacher that teaches video and um, yearbook, she has rewritten um, some of the descriptions a little bit to more match her teaching. She's in her second year with us. And there are um, just some small changes like that. And there is a document um, that we'll get to you um, 
Changes, additions are in yellow and deletions are in red. Um, and as you read through, you will see that kind of thing. And then um, in science and technology, we're going to um, retitle one of our courses, VEX Robotics. Our um, after school co curricular group in VEX is getting very popular and a lot of requests for students to take a course in that. So we're changing the title of one of our robotics classes to be VEX Robotics. Um, and we have tweaked a little bit the curriculum pathway in science and technology. And we've added this year um, a pathway um, for visual art as well. So students can really see visually um, these are the classes I need to take to take some of these advanced classes. Um, social studies, we've got a change in a textbook that's noted in here. But again, rather um, small changes. Um, but I like to review all of that with the curriculum committee. Um, I should also just let you know that Kelly Johnson will get a copy of the full program of studies out to you in advance of the March meeting. Um, Karen, my secretary and I, we're, our goal is to get that to Kelly when we go on vacation next Friday, and then she'll get it um, out. Um, she and Monique will probably work together on when to get that out so that the entire board can um, review the document and take a look. Um, but so there are documents coming your way for this. Monique, do you think I missed anything that you especially wanted me to hit on? I, I don't think so. I, I'm, I, as usual, the, you know, for a high school that offers almost 700 different courses in their program of studies to go through the entire, that entire document every year and bring it out to departments to tweak it, um, changing names um, and do it in a pretty compressed timeline um, is pretty amazing. We try to shoot for March because um, as some of our newer board members may not know is we've got to get those edits done and out to students, particularly the eighth grade students coming in as freshmen and then the um, putting that uh, program of studies out there so students can start signing up for courses and the whole scheduling process begins. So it is almost three quarters of a year is focused on the program of studies and the scheduling um, to make that high school come right along as it does with just under a thousand students. So the first meeting in March will be when, um, and I think I can stop this sharing, the first meeting in March is when Sue and I will be there to present pretty much these slides, but we will um, <clears throat> um, get this document out to you. It's a Word document with all the details. I do want to um, just thank the um, each department for the meticulous work they do on the program of studies each year. They really, really want to provide the clearest, most helpful um, information for students and families. And so that's why so many little changes are made because it is so important to them that this is a very thorough and very up-to-date document every year. And then I also want to thank Karen Sprague, who helps with all the big picture of getting all those details put together and it back into one document. So just a couple of quick thank yous. Yeah, Sue, I just want to jump in quick. That's, um, it's kind of impressive to me, actually, as somebody who taught in a high school for 11 years. I, I mean, that's to see those minor changes. I'm used to seeing a much longer list when I was on the other side. So, I, I mean, I, I think you kind of hit the nail on the head, kind of all the all the, the hard work that's going in the previous years is now creating less work, hopefully moving forward with, you know, kind of fine tuning those descriptions. Because I, I know uh, historically in, in just school, uh, you hear kids say, oh, that course isn't what I thought it was going to be. And so obviously getting a kid to be excited about a course and getting in there and then saying, this is what I thought it was you know, that, that definitely helps them, but also their parents too. Cause I know I used to get phone calls as a teacher from the parents being like, Hey, when are you covering this? I saw this in the, in the description. And that's a big reason why they decided to take the class. So um, I think it's great. I'm, I'm excited to see what everything looks like. 
And I, I just remembered one thing I failed to mention, and I want to be thorough. So um, I do want to mention that in our design, um, the music department planned on doing music theory one and two on year A, and then AP music theory on the opposite year. And our thought was to zigzag that. So students that wanted to take music theory, but not at an AP level, would have a shot every other year. However, <laughs> nice planning, except when Jeff Mosher has been running, um, talking to students about offering music theory one and two next year as our zigzag is planned. He has been overwhelmed with students that have said, no, 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 I want to take the AP course. And he's actually had no students want to take the music theory course. And so we're gonna run AP again due to student requests. And Jeff and I have been talking about if we do happen to have a straggler or two that are interested in the more than one and two, we may uh, offer it in the same period and maybe they would have slightly different expectations if they didn't want the AP level. But we've had so many requests for AP, we're zagging and zagging for a year so that um, we're meeting again what the kids are looking to take. So can I ask a quick question just um, the, about the accounting? So you mentioned that's a teacher that's already in the district and has an MBA. So he's, he's moving up from the middle school, you said? He, um, he changed jobs from the middle school to the high school and is doing our business classes now. And um, so this is his second semester teaching with us. And he has just had in his current classes and last semester, a lot of interest and requests for offering an accounting class again. And we have offered it in the past, but it's been a few years. And due to the requests he's been receiving, he's asked us to put it back in the program of studies. And I should explain, because some of you might be new to our program of studies, but we build a schedule each year based on what students ask for classes. So we may put accounting in, but we may only get a couple of students that actually register for it, and then we might not be offering it. And there are things that are in our broader program of studies that don't run every year because we have to make decisions on, this is where the student interest is, so this year we're gonna offer these classes. And we do try to tailor it as closely as possible to the requests of 900 and a quarter students but um, so we, we're going to put it back in and list it as an offering. And then we'll see if the kids do follow through and want accounting, then we'll put that in Jim's schedule. We'll make room for it. If it doesn't get, if it doesn't get the request or the sign up, then we may not offer it. We may leave it in there and see if in a, another year there are more kids that sign up together for it. That's where I, no, I appreciate that because I, I wasn't sure if he was just coming up from the middle school for that particular class. So so he's teaching other business classes as well as that. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. So Stu, as, a, as an accountant, I'm really glad <laughs> to hear that you're offering accounting because- Yeah, I'm a former business teacher. So hearing yeah. that, I was like, oh, I love hearing that. Like, you know, well, business education, financial literacy is- Huge. Yeah, it's huge. And so I'm a JA volunteer. And so I love coming in and teaching kids about the, you know, entrepreneurs and money. And there is a huge need. Yeah, you know, I'm talking, I'm always talking with my uh, uh, cohorts off in the uh, public accounting world. And there is a very much shortage of accountants. So it'd be nice to see, to see that, um, be able to fill that void and so i was curious when you you know you talk about offering accounting does that mean that um another class maybe slips off do you do you kind of like try to hold to x number of classes and so the, some classes you know to offer this another one kind of comes off the schedule how, how do you balance all that so for, in the case of jim and his schedule he would have 10 semester courses that he would teach next year, five first semester and five second. And what we would look at is like right now, he might teach multiple sections 
um, maybe four sections of one course. And next year, there might only be sign up enough for three, but we also have sign up to add this accounting. So then we would offer one less of something that didn't get as much sign up for him and offer the accounting instead. Some things we run, um, we like the music theory and the AP, we kind of run them on an every other year because we find that if we offer them every other year, there's enough sign up for a group. But we look at the numbers for, yeah. within the teacher or department and then we, um, the department heads and I put our heads together and we try to figure out what what is going to help the most students if we, you know, in, in looking at our schedule. So um, we do really try to focus on where the students need the courses or want the courses. That sounds great. Thank you. You're welcome. I was going to say last night when I was getting ready for this meeting, um, the last paragraph in Jim's um, description, um, I was chuckling because it's great advertising. He said, this course is ideal for students intending to pursue a college degree or career in accounting, business management, marketing, advertising, finance and economics, as well as students aspiring to become business owners on their own in the future. I thought that was a great, great um, large screenshot on all the ways this course might help you in the future. That's fantastic. I love it. Would a class like, and I, but we could spend, you know, hours just talking about different classes, but when you offer a class like that, can kids also get math credit for it? Cause there's so much math in that, or is that a discussion? At this point, that's a tech, that's a business tech credit. It's not um, in place of one of our math classes, okay. but our students need six years worth of electives in their four years of high school. So they can check a box in their elective in their elective category. Okay. Yeah, I wasn't sure because I've heard of other schools who do things like that, depending on obviously how they value that or if they wanted to funnel more kids through the program to kind of, you know, get them in there. But that's it's interesting. Yep. Thanks for giving us all that info. You're welcome. Uh, for the music theory class, would that be because I know in computer science we have our AP and our level four like together in one group. Um, but most kids are encouraged to sign up for AP and then drop down if they feel like it's just not quite like too, a little bit too much. Is that how music theory would run as well? Or would that be like two very separate groups? That's what we're thinking, Yulia, is we've had um, all of the students so far that have talked about it with Mr. Mosher have asked for the AP level. But he and I have discussed if if we have some students that appear on course registration, but are saying, I'm really not sure I can do the AP level, then we may keep them in the same room and change the expectations a little bit. And they would maybe, their transcript would, we, would read the music theory one and two instead of the AP. But we think we could probably make that accommodation. Okay. If there are any questions between now and March, I think it's the third, second or third, I think, um, feel free to email me and I'd be happy to get you information. Um, we're gonna give you the tight version with just the specific changes. We'll get that to this committee. And then, like I said, the whole kit and caboodle will come to you through Kelly, um, which is the whole program of studies and that, um, that entirety is what you'll be voting on on the first meeting in March. And in order to, the link in the slide deck, um, and you can go to the um, high school site to just access the current program of studies. So um, if this packet, paper packet doesn't make a whole lot of sense to you, it's nice to sort of see, look up that course and what it looks like online, and you can actually see the differences and the changes that'll happen. Um, so it's nice to have this packet and both, and I'll send that off to you tonight, um, right after this meeting. <clears throat> uh, the other piece is we, um, Sue and I will be at that board meeting to do a somewhat similar presentation. We may even use the same slides. So um, please feel free to, um, you know, as the board discusses it or has questions, 
um, it's an opportunity for you to ask questions as well or to talk and share about any of the questions that you might have um, today. Great. Thank you. You are welcome. Actually, Monique, can you speak to me about SEL and the whole? Can you... Sure. Yeah. Okay, sure. great. I'd love to um, be educated a little bit more. Sure. And this, I, I don't know if that's something we can, um, Sue Ketch is here for the program of studies. If that's something that's beyond the pro high school program of studies, um, I'd like to say thank you to Sue Ketch and um, have you carry on with your evening if you'd like. Yes. Thank you, Sue. You're very welcome. Thank I'm, you, glad, Sue. I'm glad I was thank invited. Thanks, Sue. Have a good Bye -bye. night. Night. And Monique and Brian, if I'm hijacking anything, you just let me know. No, I just wanted to make sure Sue was done. So I, I agree yeah. with Monique. I, if she didn't say it, I was about to say the same thing. So I, I, I'm sure people have questions and want to chat about some other things. But um, I just wanted to make sure Sue was done and, you know, kind of said her piece. Oh, that's good. Thank you. Sure. We're going to be doing um, our, uh, a presentation. I'm going to be doing a presentation. I'll be assisted with our K-12 SEL specialist at the March 16th workshop on SEL. Um, I'm kind of, I've been at this stuff a long time. I'm kind of old school. I'm the product of, um, oh my goodness, I think it was six years of parochial school. And over the years, it's um, now it's currently called SEL. Um, it's called social emotional learning. Um, but um, way back, even when I was going to school, it's really life skills sorts of things. It's really about how um, helping our students be self-aware, <clears throat> learning about their emotions. It is about learning um, self-management skills, how to bring your best brain to your work, to focus on your work, to be prepared for class. Um, it's also about social awareness, understanding others within the classroom. Um, we have a be kind, respect codes, all those sorts of things. It's all of that. It's also about being a good citizen, learning to listen, <clears throat> learning to communicate well and kindly. Um, it's also about responsible decision making in terms of setting goals and following your goals. So they're really life skills. Um, one of the things that um, the research wasn't there when I was in school, but what the research is showing is that for real lasting learning to happen, um, those things need to be in place. It enhances the academics. It also enhances success in life. So it's really about how to, those are, it's the skills, sometimes they're called executive functioning skills. Sometimes they're called soft skills. Sometimes they're learning to learn skills. Sometimes they're, they're um, workforce skills. You know, when I look at like the scans report from way back when and all those things, they're all the skills that employers want from their employees. Um, and so that's why we, well, before the pandemic, we started to focus on that. Um, and then um, through the pandemic, the need became even greater um, for lots of reasons. Um, one is just everyone has experienced trauma. We know that when people are under trauma, their working memory doesn't work so well. Um, and so that's what we're working on. So I'm gonna do a, a presentation to the board during that workshop and we'll go into sort of the details of what we're looking at. We use the CASEL framework, C-A-S-E-L, and that's CASEL.org. And it's really, it's a collaborative for academic and social emotional learning. And so that is the goal is um, academic learning, but the found, it's really about helping to build the foundational skills to get there. Sorry, that was quite a bit. Now, Mo Monique, I think that meeting's gonna be really insightful to a lot of people because that, that acronym is thrown around so much. And I don't think unless people are in or have been in the teaching space before, I don't think they quite know what goes into that and what kids are expecting of that. So I, um, you know, or I should say what's expected of teachers there too. So I, I think all of that'll be pretty insightful. Yeah, I just um, facilitated a meeting this morning around um, part of the SEL efforts um, is, you know, the practices and the culture pieces and the behavior expectations and all of those pieces. But there's also some direct instruction about how our brains work. You know, what are these things, emotions? Where do they come from? Why do we get frightened? Why do we freeze? How do we persevere? 
Um, how do we bring our best brain? How do we stay focused? Um, and looking at some direct instruction curriculum materials that have been vetted by this CASEL organization. Um, and it, it was really interesting because one of the things that we realized is, you know, a, a single classroom teacher might have a sort of set of expectations for their students and another classroom teacher might have a set of expectations in another classroom. And the specialists, the art and music folks, you know, they get all the kids. And so it has to be kind of a school-wide effort. Um, so it, it was an interesting um, review process, but it was really interesting hearing the perspectives of the different people in a school building um, and the importance of everybody being on the same page with our students. Is that helpful, Carolyn, or is that just a little too much? Yeah, yeah no, no, that is helpful. I I need to do, no, that was very good. I need to do a little research I, um, myself, and I'll probably, I just need to get myself a little more, a lot more informed, actually. So, um, but yeah, no, that was very helpful. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, just to piggyback off of Carolyn with all the SCL stuff, um, is this, through the panorama survey that you're going, that's oh, good implemented now, right around this time? Yep, we are, and I'm gonna go over all of that too in this workshop. Um, so I'm glad you brought it up right now. Um, we, our district goal is to improve the social emotional learning of each and every student. And so how we track that progress, um, a panorama education has um, what are called perception surveys. So students are surveyed, asked questions in those areas, and we are doing one. And so that's how we, we track our progress. There are certain topics like belonging, um, topics like supportive relationships, and there are questions under those that the students answer. And we get a little bit, of, we get what's called a percent favorable, how our students feel, what their perceptions are. And um, we look at that to track our performance and see if there's growth year to year with our students. And this, what we're assessing right now is our student skills and competencies in these areas. Um, you know, their ability to regulate their emotions. Emotion regulation is one. Self-management is another, whether or not they can manage their behaviors. Um, so those surveys are happening now. In the spring, there's another dimension to the SEL, which is sort of supports an environment. And we wanna hear from our students how safe they feel in school, um, whether they have um, an adult or another student that they can count on. So the supports and environments is another dimension. We are very careful not to over survey students. Um, so that survey will be taken later this year, I think end of April into early May. And we also, with those supports and environments, we also survey staff um, because their health and their social emotional um, environment is also important to us as well. Um, so we will, I think the window is closing Friday. I think I'm closing it Friday. Um, I just put out a reminder email to the principals and shared some response rates. Um, so that they can analyze, they'll analyze and take a look at the data. And typically in early March, we work with the staff on the data um, where we look at trends. <clears throat> and the panorama also has a component where, um, for example, if we're noticing that our school um, is not progressing as we want in a certain area, like supportive relationships, they have partner resources so you can go into an area of their web portal called Playbook, and there are ideas and resources and activities that teachers can use to work with students. So Yulia, the, you may be familiar with the um, advisory um, at the high school and the activities that some of the advisors do with students during advisory. And, um, some of those activities have come from the Playbook. I know my advisor makes it very much like, because we do, I think a lot of my advisory needs to see other teachers, but occasionally he'll like put it up on the board and be like, hey, if you wanna do this, you can do it. Um, but I know, cause in the past when teachers try to be more forceful about it and force kids to stay in their advisories and do this activity, it just, everyone's on their phones and not doing it instead. So it's kind of like a, 
like a nice activity you can do but I feel like most of the time people are kind of out doing their own thing Monique you were saying about the um, um, data that we get from the surveys like can we show are we able to see progression in how our kids are doing and are, are we doing better are we staying yes. the same or how's that how's that oh. look in Scarborough um, uh, yes, by groups and grade levels, um, not, not individual data. Yeah. Um, in some topics, there are, have been some gains. Um, Wentworth is an area where the topics didn't show as many gains, which is kind of curious um, because they do in a whole lot of efforts. But what we found when we started digging into the data um, was we were worried that um, particularly last year, we just, the kids really didn't know how to answer the survey questions. They were confused um, and because the questions are worded a little different. So this year, what we've done is we have um, used some resources to help students with the vocabulary and really worked with them on how to answer the questions. So I'm curious to see how, whether or not that impacts the data. Um, but at the questions? high school, some topics grew. Um, at the middle school, some topics grew, some were flat. Wentworth seemed to go further um, in decline more than we wanted to see. But I'll share all that data at, on, on March 16th. Are those questions, they're more like, like self-reflection kind of questions, like assessing yourself? In some cases, yes. Like there would be a question like, I'm trying to see where my pile is. There would be a question like, uh, here's one about uh, how sure are you that you can complete all the work that's assigned in your class? Mm -hmm. When complicated ideas are discussed in class, how sure are you that you can understand them? How sure are you you can learn all the topics taught in your class? Um, so Monique, like what, yep. when you when you answer, when kids answer questions like that and they say, um, you know, some may say, yeah, I'm pretty sure I get it. And then some say, uh, no, I'm not. Um, what does that lead to? Does that lead to a different curriculum? Does that lead to more help? Uh, what does that translate? I, well, I guess my my yeah. one concern is I just I don't I don't want to see the curriculum cut back. I want to see it be challenging. Um, right, right. Uh, so, absolutely, yeah. absolutely, and that is the um, that's always my caution around any data set is that we don't we see a data set and we you know suddenly shift gears from one data set. Um, and so um, based on that data, what we've done in the past with this is we're looking for progress over time. Um, when we see areas that are concerning, what we do is we have conversations, we look for other data sets, other data on it, as well as um, we have conversations about, okay, what can we do about that? Um, do we wanna make that a goal and organize our efforts around that? So it's not that for those particular questions, that those questions really lead to, I believe they fall under a topic around um, uh, student self-efficacy, whether kids believe they can learn. It doesn't mean that we're going to drop our standards or our expectations for them. On the contrary, we need to figure out a way to keep those high expectations, but help students build a sense of efficacy and a self-confidence that they can do hard work. Oh, that's great. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, For the sake of trying to stay on, on time here, I know we don't have to- Reel me in, Brian. Reel me in. Yeah. No, no, no. I, I mean, it's a good question. And honestly, I have more questions too, but I'm thinking, okay, Monique is going to be doing a workshop on all this SEL stuff anyway. So we'll have a good opportunity where some of these, I could see some of our uh, peers having similar questions too. So it might make sense for us to ask them in the broader group. Um, but for the sake of time, uh, two things I wanted to try to do. I know Jenna might have some questions of which I think might 
help us make an agenda for next time because I think some of those topics, at least one of them that she mentioned, um, we can definitely talk about. And then uh, trying to set uh, just a consistent time that we're going to meet. I, I don't know if, you know, what is this, the second Wednesday of the month? I don't know if that works for everybody or if that would conflict with something, but um, it definitely would help. That way we can try to get into a routine here. Mm -hmm. Does the second um, Wednesday work? For now, I think it works for me, um, as long as it's after 3.30. I'm on a teaching schedule. OK. Oh. Yeah, um, the Wednesday works. OK, Yulia, yeah, does that work for you? Wednesday works. Well, I got okay. my rehearsal schedule finally, so OK. That. Good. And Monique, does, does this time usually work if we went the second Wednesday of the month? OK. All right, so great. So then we can plan on that. Um, and I can let Kelly know just because I know she likes to have that up on the website. And we'll, we'll keep it at 6 p.m. Okay, and then um, Jenna, did you want to? Yes, so I have two questions and they're kind of, they can kind of lead to the same things. Um, first, we've gotten a couple questions and I know I've asked this myself before as a parent, um, publishing curriculum for our prospective families and current families. Um, I know that had been a goal for you at some point, Monique, but I yeah. know you've also had a very busy year. Um, so I wanted to see what an update on that might be. Um, yeah. And, you know, this is also because it's a hot topic mm -hmm. question now with all the civil rights stuff um, and how that lines up with our curriculum. So I think we can maybe set that for our next meeting since I, that might be a lengthier discussion um, because that's going to be, that's that's the big issue right now that we're kind of seeing a lot of Absolutely. headlines for in media and our own emails, um, a, lot of, a lot of questions regarding curriculum and civil rights specifically, but it would be helpful for our community um, and all the families to be able to see what we're putting out there for our kids um, mm -hmm. so they can kind of feel maybe relief, um, get a better understanding of how this is implemented in our schools. Yeah, and I, I think, and uh, Jenna and Carolyn, you guys can correct me, but I think especially when we see, we've received a, a couple different emails connected to this over the last month or two, but a lot of it is how does, how is it determined as to what ends up into the curriculum if it's connected to civil rights? Um, mm -hmm. who determines that. Um, and then I know there's been similar discussion around, I believe it's the civil rights club and, um, you know, kind of who determines what they talk about and when and to who, like, is that approved and whatnot. So um, I, again, we kind of knew that would be a bigger discussion. So I don't think it makes sense to start it now, but if we right. want to keep that in mind for our next meeting, that, that could make for a good discussion, I think. Mm -hmm. Right. I think that's a great yeah. idea. Civil rights is the one that is the hot topic and has come before you, but we have lots of people come in and, and do things with our students in school. Mm -hmm. um, certainly less controversial, but um, we have lots of um, activities and resources that come in from the outside. And so that's a great question. How does all that get vetted? Mm -hmm. Awesome. All right, anybody else have any other questions, thoughts, suggestions for items for future meetings? Obviously that last one, as we kind of go, we uh -huh. might determine what some of those are, but I just figured since we mentioned yeah. that one. Yeah, my yeah. only my only thought and um, is around what are we doing or what can we do or can we do anything with regards to, you know, catching up for to pre-COVID levels. Yeah. <laughs> uh, you know, what is, you know, how how far behind are we? Um, hopefully, hopefully not, but I have I have absolutely no idea. And then, you know, what can we do to uh to uh get back on track? Um maybe we already have a program in place. I have no idea. But that that's so, one is curiosity for that me. That was actually that was actually one of our goals. Um, board goals last year, Carolyn, okay. when we were trying to determine um, just a baseline because yeah. there was a lot going on. And I think mm -hmm. it was really difficult um, to kind of 
gauge exactly just because the state had changed their their testing so frequently and maybe they did that on purpose so that we couldn't track it very well but mm. i think that was part of the the goal um this yeah. year was to try to figure out where you know scarborough is and how scarborough is doing relative to neighborhood towns and i'm sure the teachers and and the each of this the principals must have if not solid data from testing must have at least some anecdotal data as to where they how they feel things are and i'm sure monique you probably have a wealth of knowledge in your brain about how how things are going and so I'd just be curious to hear hear everybody's perspective on that absolutely that's been my worry since the pandemic, yeah. pandemic, <laughs> yeah. the pandemic. um yeah actually there's a, a meeting last night on um listening to an expert in reading um uh, and and, and evidence-based practices, what the science of reading is telling us works for students and to, you know, really focus in on the essential pieces to make sure that we keep those gaps, um, closing those gaps. Um, I can say that our students, particularly for, um, in my last um, bit of looking at fall to fall with the school board is our students are still generally performing above the national average um, it, and it's a pre-pandemic average um, and growing. Um, they're not growing, and this is nationally because the growth targets that we had from the state, and this is what I shared last spring, the growth targets that we had from the state are pre-pandemic growth targets. Our students aren't growing at the same rate as they did or, or would have done before the pandemic. And I think that's part of the trauma piece. And so one of the things we're trying to focus on is the growth and watch and seeing what we can do to promote student growth um, as well. I'm more, my big piece um, is really, I wanna know how our students compare both in terms of growth, but also in terms of performance. Um, and national, I'm more, I'm less concerned about Maine and I'm more concerned about nationally. And I'm most concerned about internationally because when they move out and leave the doors of Scarborough schools, they are going to be competing internationally um, at this point um, for places in colleges, universities, post-secondary in the workforce, whatever program they choose, post-secondary key. So I try and set a pretty high bar for our students um, because they're not going necessarily going to be competing um, at colleges and universities with other kids from Maine only. Oh, you're hundred um, percent right. All right. Um, no, good discussion. I, I mean, I, I, I'm excited to see what this committee does. I, I think we have a lot of ideas and I, I think the one thing I like, everybody's very invested and interested that is here, which is great. I, I mean, even just today's one hour meeting kind of shows that with the questions we had and the things even looking forward for future meetings. So I, I think that's important to, you know, in order to create change or create stability and growth is to have that passion and that true interest. So looking forward to working together with everybody. Um, anybody have any final thoughts or Monique, anything else from you? No, I just appreciate your time um, to be school board members and doing this work. It's very much appreciated. And it, I recognize how much time it takes. So I appreciate we your appreciate you. <laughs> yeah, yeah, Thank same you. here. All right, everyone. Well, uh, we will plan for our next meeting on the second Wednesday of next month, 6 p.m. I'll, I'll uh, either myself or Kelly will send out a reminder with an updated Zoom link. Okay. Thanks, everyone. Thank you All right, so have much. a great Thanks. night. Thanks. Thank have you. a good night. Good night, Jenna.